Hello and welcome to coverage of Pro Tour Cons of Tarkir. We're in Hawaii. I'm Marshall Sutcliffe in the booth with Zach Hill, and we are just about to get underway in the first draft of the first day of competition here. We're going to be watching Reed Duke, Zach, one of the best players on the planet. Yeah, Reed, no question. I mean, one of the you know the results he's been able to put up over the last couple of years are totally outstanding. A member of that uh, team of Owen Turtenwald, William Jensen, him, they call themselves Peach Garden. Oh, they've been dominating the team circuit. Reed individually, obviously, a front runner in the player of the year race. Really interested to see how he approaches this format. Everybody I've talked to seems to have a different theory about how to draft cons of Tarkin. And these aren't just, these are people that we know play a lot of limited, think about limited a lot, and yet they have different opinions. Let's see what Reed has for his opener here. Wow, wow. he's opened a mythic rare here. Soren, solemn visitor, looks like he's pulled that one to the front. Yeah, I mean, and Soren, you know, he's he's also opposing colors, which means you don't mind first picking him as much in this format, uh, even though you're committing to a gold color combination that gives you access to two of the five clans, in addition to, of course, the raw power the Planeswalker represents. What else are we looking at in this pack? Anything, well, I, Marshall? Yeah, I see that there's a Bear's Companion and a Burnaway, which are two cards that don't go particularly well with Soren, uh, but he's also got a Feet of Resistance pulled to the front as well as, well, as, well as an Alpine Grizzly. So he's going to take Soren. That much seemed pretty clear from the get-go, but he also has to take a look at the rest of the pack to see what he might get back and also to try to decide what type of grouping of colors he wants to go in. Right now, starting things off by being in white-black, that's a nice place to start in this format. That is a, a two-color pair that goes very well together and has a lot of rewards. Uh, for staying in a base one. Now, I see that there's a debilitating injury that he's got, and I'm assuming that that would be his pick, though... What Wait. else does he have pulled here? Wait, he's got a 4-5 for just 4 mana. Oh, he's got mana. Bellowing Saddle Brute pulled actually ahead of Debilitating Injury here. So, you know, that could be interesting. If he is looking to be aggressive and looking to attack which black and white are quite good at, then Bellowing Saddle Brute might actually be better. And, yeah, it looks like he's taking it. Yeah, I mean, the rate on that card is just totally incredible. Debilitating Injury, kind of the consensus best common in the format. A good piece of removal. Minus 2, minus 2 enchantment to any creature. But Saddle Brute can just take over a game by itself. That's true. All right, so let's take a look at what he finds here out of his next pack. Ooh, that's the kind of... Oh, wow! Wow, a Ghost a Fire Ghost Blade. A Ghost Fire third. Blade, third pick. I did not think I would see that at the Pro Tour stage, Zach. That card is absolutely fantastic in this format. I have lost many games to it, for example. Yeah, I mean, Ghost Fire Blade, one mana, three to equip to give a creature plus two, plus two. If it's equipping a colorless creature, it only costs one, but you don't really even need that bonus to make it tremendously powerful. But now, it, did he take Chief of the Edge? He did. He took Chief of the Edge, and there's a reason for that. The Ghost Fire Blade goes best in a deck that's going to be playing a lot of morphs, and I don't think that uh, Reed... And anticipates playing as many morphs as needed to make that card truly great. Is that a dead drop? Yes, it is. Wow. Uh, so, but Chief of the Edge goes exactly into his two-color pair, and he's going to he's gonna prioritize that. Yeah, he's taken two black-white gold cards and an extremely efficient attacker and blocker. Right. Uh, Saddle Brood. I mean, I think it's also a warrior, too, which helps for uh, the warrior theme. Dead drop, a, an incredibly powerful card in this format. You might look at it and say, 10 mana, can I even cast this? But it's just risen in most of the pro players pick order the more and more they play the set yeah i think the, the the way to think about it is if you do get to resolve it you're highly likely to win the game there yeah. are some decks that are pretty resilient against it decks that can make a lot of tokens don't care about it that much but otherwise it's fantastic all right there's a mardu rough rider for reed which he could dip over into red for pretty easily he's pulled Mindswipe to the front though i can't imagine that that's the direction he wants to go after taking all the the red and black there's a uh, rakshasa's secret which is a decent card as well. Uh, for an aggressive deck, too, you can kind of clear away a bunch of the clunky cards that are stuck in people's hand. The real question here for Reed is, all right, it, w the question I was thinking of is, does he want to take the Rough Rider and start dipping over into red or not? That's the most obvious route to take is to dip into red, but he didn't want to. I think with Blossoming Sands, he's just ta he's indicating a preference for the power of mana fixing in this format. I mean, yes. there were some very good cards in that pack. Blossoming Sands opens him up to being able to splash or play some Obzon cards. And uh, it looks like he's moving Bitter Revelation to the front now. A, a great way to fuel that dead drop and gain some card advantage. That's right. There's also another Blossoming Sands in this pack, so if he really likes the idea of splashing for green, he could do it. But no, he takes Bitter Revelation here. 
Reed wants to make sure that he can reload after, you know, getting off to an aggressive start potentially. Yeah, exactly. I mean, it also digs him closer to that Soren that we've seen. The overall really high card quality in his, in his packs right now. And a bit of revelation, great combination with dead drop because it can find you the drop and stock up your graveyard to be able to cast it. Here's a Kiru Bloodsucker as well that he's now pulled to the front. Uh, Bloodsucker a lot less exciting, I think, than... than it, a lot of the other cards he's seen right now. I mean, that, that might be a signal that black is drying up in this pack. Still I've, a fine I've, card. It's still fine, yeah. I, I found that, uh, that reading signals in this format can get quite tricky. Uh, <laughs> you don't always know just because you get a card in the middle part that it's actually a signal because people are playing so many different colors. Here's a second bitter revelation. There's also a Bloodfell Caves, but... You know that I, I don't know how many he he's got two bitter revelations now. I don't I can't imagine you'd want more than than two of those. Yeah, I mean, and I'm I'm surprised given how aggressively we saw him pick the green white ETB gain a life land that he yeah, he wasn't sands, equally yeah. likely blossoming sands. He wasn't as likely to pick a uh, a black red land, but I, I guess he just values bitter revelation pretty highly. Now he's pulled. He took a war behemoth here. And uh, so it does. I think what you mentioned earlier, Zach. I think it does indicate a preference from Reed for Obzon. Yeah, I think so, too. Obviously, the deck able to leverage that toughness. Warbeam, just a, a solid filler right now. He's, he gives him a three-drop. Right now, his mana curve is kind of high, so he needs something to do in the early game. That's right. Now, he's going to go ahead and take uh, the caves this time, which is <laughs> interesting. Um, you know, he did have a chance to take Assault Road Patrol there, but he passed on it. So Bloodfell Cave, he's basically solidly in black-white and open to being able to splash either green or red. That's right. And now we're sort of entering the the Drakes. He takes a disdainful stroke there. But, you know, the, the one interesting card that did come back was the Bear's Companion. Bear's Companion's still in the pack? Uh, not in this one, but it was three picks before. Oh, okay. Yeah, right. you know, he did wheel it, though. And, uh, you know, he kind of gave a little shrug when it came by. Card's pretty powerful. He's taking a cranial archive now as the pack begins to dry up. I knock Tracker, not exactly something that... Uh, He's excited to play. Could theoretically do it on the red Yeah, I mean, Anosh Tracker is playable. Like, he did pick up a little bit of red fixing. All right, so let's see where this went for him. Clearly, he's in black. That seems to be his base color. And then he wants to play white for Chief of the Edge and Soren. And, you know, beyond that, I, you know, he's kind of can go where he wants to go. It's, it's not like his deck is, is really pushing him too hard towards green or red at this point. Really interesting. I mean, his first five picks were of such a high power level. Um, and, and then the pack really seemed to dry up a little bit. I mean, it, he might be valuing Bitter Revelation highly. We saw him pick it over several other options. I think the question for Reed is going to be if he's able to fill out his mana curve. Right now he has a two drop. He has one reasonably solid three drop, another okay three drop, but but very little in the early game and a lot clustered around the four slot. So I think he's gonna need either some early removal or some early creatures to be able to provide some beat down. Otherwise, uh, you know, he might just be, have a handful of cards that he can't cast. All right, let's see what he's open. He opened an ankle shanker here. So another little gentle nudge over in the Mardu direction potentially. But he doesn't have to take it, and there's a Nomad Outpost that he's pulled to the front, along with a Disowned Ancestor. Disowned Ancestor, I think, is really overperformed in this format relative to what an 0-4 yeah. you'd normally expect it to be. But Nomad Outpost uh, is kind of exactly what he wants. Oh, He had a wow. Chief of the Scale hiding in there as well. Now that's kind of made its way to the front of the pack, and I can't blame him. There's also a Smite the Monstrous. He doesn't have removal at the moment, so he is going to want to pick up some at some point. But Chief of the Scale has got to be the pick here. Yeah, I mean, it goes perfectly with what the rest of his deck is doing. So that was a pretty powerful pack for him to open as well. But like you, like we said, you know, one of the strategies that you want to take in this format is to try to be two colors and then maybe splash a third, or if you can help it, not. If you can just be a two-color deck, you're going to beat up on a lot of decks that are trying to get cute, play too many morphs and, and too many slow cards, uh, enter the battlefield, tap lands, and the, and the like. Ooh, a Grim Horror Specs here for, for Reed. That's a nice pickup. Yeah, Horror Specs, incredibly powerful to hard cast or to morph. Unmorphing for a single B, you're able usually to gain some card advantage if you can set up a trade that's advantageous to you. Also, just a good early game card. I think that's probably the front runner in this pack. Uh, definitely. I've, I found that card quite strong. I you mean, I think the thing about it is that it makes trades advantageous for you. <laughs> it's just yeah, like, exactly. sure, trade, trade, trade. Right. <laughs> 
We saw a rush of battle in the pack. That might be something he can table if he gets uh, a little bit lucky. Okay. Let's see what Reed finds here. There's another Rakshasa's secret. Nothing too exciting for him here, though. There's an archer's parapet he's got back there. Dutiful return. Uh, Russian yeah, battle, which yeah. again is, is pretty good in the black white warrior deck, but the fact that it's a sorcery mean you're not going to surprise anybody. I mean, again, no. secret's a great way to set up dead drop. It's a good follow up to one of his chiefs at the two slot. I'm just getting concerned about his removal situation, and you know he he wants to have a more proactive plan. His creatures are very good, but he doesn't have a lot. You know, right. it, he's now got two of Rakshasa's secret. Oh, let's take a look at his next pack here. Oh, wow. Another bellowing saddle brute there. Yeah. Oh, a debilitating injury. I mean, black is just wide open in this seat. It certainly is. The question is, does Reed still value the bellowing saddle brute over the debilitating injury at this point, or does he feel like now he needs to hedge back a little bit and, and get some removal going? That's the question. I mean, he does. his only removal right now is dead drop, but saddle brute is just so powerful. Yeah, it looks like he's consistently taking saddle brute over debilitating injury. He knows how strong that card is. It is so tough to deal with in this format, especially if you dig it off to one of those decent starts where you're attacking and you can get the raid, no downside on that card, and just uh, start pounding for four. You see Smite the Monstrous. Yeah, he's seen a bunch Windstorm. of those, and he, he always pulls them to the front, but there's a swarm of blood flies as well. I mean, Smite sort of solves the removal issue we were talking about. It's yeah. expensive, it's conditional, but it does deal with your opponent's major threats. And if he's leaning on those saddle brutes, the only cards he's going to need to be worried about are anything on the table that, that yeah, happens to be bigger. That's a great point. And that's what he ends up taking is a Smite. Yep. All right, so starting to work on that removal a little bit here. Ah, an Alabaster Kieran, I, I think that card's great. Oh, he's got a few other uh, reasonable picks here as well. There's a Merrick Nightblade. A pretty decent, you know, it's it's a little clunky as a 2-3 for 4, but it gets better from there, thankfully. I mean, the, the thing is, uh, so many of these cards that are good in the pack just cost 4 mana again. I mean, yes. it looks like he's going to take the Nightblade, but, I mean, he really does have a glut of spells at the 4 slot. Yeah. I really like Alabaster Kieran in this format, by the way. I think that card's overperformed for me. When I saw it, I thought, yeah, sure, that's fine. Right. But it's actually better than it looks. Wow. Look at that. An Obzon Guide and an Armament Core. You think Obzon's open in this Goodness. draft? Jeez. There's yeah. also a Shambling Attendance, though, which is a, a, a particularly nice, you know, what do we call it? A five drop? Four drop? <laughs> yeah, maybe optimistically a four drop. It's really like a, a seven or an eight, but... I mean, he took Armament Core. Armament Core is as close to a bomb as you're going to get at the uncommon slot. Yes. I mean, it, it effectively it does something right when you cast it. It's a good size body anyway. And he's already got a little bit of green fixing. Yeah, he has one Blossoming Sands already, so he's not too far off. I see an Abomination of Gadul back there, a Secret Plans. He's just going to take the land here, though, a Rugged Highlands. Which is interesting. It fixes red and green, which are both colors that he might be able to splash if he wants to. Is that a disowned ancestor? Oh, but he's got a jungle hollow pulled to the front. Another Obzon Guide as well. <laughs> Jeez. Wow. I mean, I don't know about you, but when I play Obzon Guide and I turn that thing face up, I feel like I can't lose. Yeah, it's it's incredible. Yeah. An eight-point life swing. I mean, it's good to block. Even if they trade with it, you gain yourself four life. But Jungle Hollow, I think, incredibly important right now if he's going to be able to take advantage of some of the Obzon cards he sees late in the pack. Here's a Sidisi's Pet. N not not a great morph cdc's no. pet it, it's okay it, i don't think I, i'd be surprised if it made the cut in what uh, reed's trying to do it is possible though i mean i like it just as something you can do on turn three mm -hmm. you know oh, that's mean, a good point yeah he's got so much at four that he needs to just deploy some of the battlefield i actually don't hate a banner in his deck with as high as mana curve is yeah it feels like he wants to be more assertive than that but maybe he's gonna have to just concede that uh that his deck actually isn't you know, quite that assertive. It's a little bit more of a mid-range deck. Right. I mean, uh, a lot of the time you want to draft black-white very aggressively, but we've seen, you know, no Mardu Skull Hunters, none of the cards that really, uh, Mardu Hate Blade, none of the cards that really geared that deck toward an aggressive slant. I mean, he's right. basically seeing a lot of the top of the curve of the black-white deck. 
Last pick, active treason for Reed. So that pack went pretty well for him as well. He's definitely curving out. I mean, his good cards are really good. Yeah. And then his 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 filler stuff is is lacking a little bit, and I think that's what he's going to need to be looking for the most. But you know, he picked up a chief of the scale. Now he's got both of them. He's got Soren sitting there still. I wonder if he just wants to find some tokens of some sort. You know, it feels like he wants some just something. I mean, I think he wants green mana fixing. I think he wants uh, you know disown ancestors, Mardu skull hunters. I think he wants cards that just like what about horde chief. Ah, you know, get some Mardu Horde Chiefs in there. Yeah, be, I mean, it, again, like, I don't know how often you're going to be able to trigger Raid, but I, I think that Ancestor it's is, like, his best way to do it, right? I think so. Yeah. No, you're right. I mean, I guess he has a, a few decent two-drops, but if we don't focus on just the quality and, and on the number instead, it, it actually goes down a little bit. Yeah, I mean, right now he has two. <laughs> exactly. I, 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 I would, I mean, I think a card that it just any way to fix his mana to take care uh, of armament core. I mean, the thing is, if he's gaining life, he's not, the game's not going to end quickly, and he can take advantage of some of these really powerful late game cards. Yeah. So, Reed, working on what is shaping up to be an Obzon mid range deck. And a pretty nice one at that. Yeah, and it really is base black white. I think he's got a couple of Obzon cards and a couple of pieces of mana fixing. I think the thing that he's likely to see, though, given how late those were in the pack, he's got to be anticipating that there's going to be more Obzon that opens up in the third pack. Right. And he wants to be positioned to capitalize on that. Yeah. Yeah, I'd love to see a couple of Obzon guides in his deck, because that way, if he just draws... If he doesn't draw his green mana, he can still play them. And we see another, is that another saddle brute. <laughs> saddle brute is he on mono saddle brute aggro here for <laughs> Reed Duke? I like this plan. I'm not gonna lie. Like, this is the kind of thing where you play against somebody and you play a turn four saddle brute every game, and they're like, he always has it. <laughs> <laughs> it's like actually, yeah, I've got three. And we see Skull Hunter also feet of resistance, which is just moving up the pick order of a lot of people's white cards. Absolutely. It's a combat trick, but. It does everything. I mean, but it, we've seen him value Saddle Brood so highly. It would be very surprising to me if that's not what he took. But there's also a Trail of Mystery, which a lot of people were saying is a first pick quality card. Although, you know, it would be on the splash. He doesn't have that many morphs. But I, I think he's just got to go for the raw power here. I like it. I mean, stick with your plan. Like, if he just curves up to a Bellowing Saddle Brood every single game, like, that is very, very tough to deal with. Yeah, and, and I mean, Saddle Brood. Then next turn, attack with your Saddle Brute. Play another one. I mean, that wow. is hard to beat. Wow. Butcher of the Horde here for Reed. And that is one of the more powerful rares that you're going to get. But he's in a tough spot because he's got a suppression field, and he really isn't geared to move over to red that well. He does have one mana fixer that could help him do it. But, geez, Butcher of the Horde is so powerful. He's got a green-red dual land. Yeah. And right now, only, like, one green card. So he could conceivably just do black white splash two colors but i mean suspension field also a really powerful spell and yeah. reed is lacking in removal he is and that's what it, he takes yeah it feels like the disciplined pick is to take the suspension field but it's got to be tempting to dip over for that butcher of the horde but he takes the suspension field so like we said before you know his deck is really looking to be uh black white and then maybe he'll touch green maybe he won't Ooh, ponyback brigade Another Kiru Bloodsucker. That yeah. would be his second copy. Gives him something to do early. I mean, Ponyback Brigade, good if he wants to dip into red, but then he's got to be asking himself, look, if my plan was to play red, I would take the magic card Butcher of the Horde, right. <laughs> arguably one of the most powerful cards in the entire format. So I, I would expect them to be leaning toward Bloodsucker. I mean, he doesn't really need another Bitter Revelation. Yeah, I guess he can use the Karo Bloodsuckers to sack his uh, Bellowing Saddle Brutes now and, <laughs> and use them kind of as a finisher. That's interesting, yeah. Yeah, I mean, you don't normally think of the uh, the white black deck as being able to really capitalize on Kiru Bloodsucker that strongly, but I think it can. Well, right, and with three saddle brutes, it, you know, he doesn't have to sack creatures to take advantage of Bloodsucker. You just play Bloodsucker, play saddle brute. Yeah. Either he kills them with saddle brute, or they deal with him, and he mm -hmm. gains four life. Absolutely. All right, so here is Despise that Reed has pulled to the front. There's another War Behemoth sitting back there as well. There's an Icy Blast in this pack. That's a card that yeah. can really wreck Reed, but he can't play it himself, so he's going to take the Despise. And there's an Afrit Weapon Master toward the back of the pack, too. I mean, definitely someone at this table is getting hooked up. Yep. 
Oh, he's, he's a, oh, a dutiful return for a second. I thought that was another dead drop. Oh, and he's got to be excited to see uh, Blossoming Sands here. More green mana fixing and uh, kind of I, I think is exactly what only, he's looking for. Is his only green card still, though, the Armament Core that we're looking at actually playing? Yeah, I think so. But, I mean, that's definitely a card that, like, you want to cast on turn five. You know, you don't want to be waiting around for a green source to cast it. It's true. Yeah, I'd love to see Reed pick up, like like I said, like an Obzon guide here. You know, just a right. morph that he can play anyway to start getting uh, some type of action going in the early stages. There's a kill shot. Oh, man. Is that a death frenzy? That is a death frenzy. Mm. And, and, you know, a lot of the time you're like, okay, why would I want to do that in my black-white deck? But he, he's not very aggressive. He doesn't have that many tokens. So, I mean, death frenzy doesn't really kill that it many of his own not. creatures. The only one I can think of offhand is the uh, the Chief of the Blade. Right. And, and even death doesn't worry me as the he, other's key for the scale. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> is that what he took? It is. All right. Interesting. Oh, man. Late Disown Ancestor, also a kill shot in the pack. I think he's going to go for the kill shot, but this is exactly what he wants to see. There's a teamer charm floating around back there. Like you said, if anybody who's really committed to a clan downstream is going to get something. We've already seen stuff from Jeskai, from Teamer, from Mardu getting passed along through Reed here. So, Yeah, that kill shot is important to him. I mean, he now has a, a reasonable mass of removal. Yes. Which is something he was lacking in the first two packs. All right, so here's a Krumar Bonkin. That seems like a nice pickup here. Yeah, I think so. I mean, we're, we've are we been talking, uh, you know, about the morphs that he needs, and, and really Bonkin just allows him to support all of those bellowing saddle brutes. I mean, once the game gets to turn five, turn six, Reed's going to have a lot of size on the board. And another... I love oh. Jeskai's student here just as something to do in the early game, and as a bonus, it, it survives death frenzy. There's that trail of mystery wheeling around the table, That's by nuts. the way. It's been, I, I, I don't think that card's that great myself, but I think it's fine. Like, if you have a ton of morphs, you can kind of go off with it, but some people really like it. I am in the camp of people that you, really you, like it. You really like it, yeah, yeah. But this is how this format is. People you know, disagree all the time. Sadisi's pet is back. Oh, there's and, and an unwilling Krumar, but the four is a little stacked up for Reed, so I guess he doesn't need it. Yeah, and Pet is really interesting because Pet can force his opponent to commit more creatures to the board, walking them right into his death frenzy. You know, I mean, it's it's a card that you, you know, it's not a phenomenally powerful card, but it plays into the style of what Reed's deck's trying to do. Just took a villainous wealth there. Ah, uh, Villainous Wealth. That is one of the more fun cards in the format. <laughs> if you haven't had a chance to blast one of those at your opponent, you are missing out. The thing is, with all the morphs in this set, there's a lot of, like, six casting cost creatures, so you really want to be casting Villainous Wealth for, like, nine total mana to get the amount of value out of it that you want. But once you do, I mean, you're you're probably winning that game. I prefer to do it for X equals nine, but <laughs> to each their own, Zach. Uh -huh. <laughs> do you cast Howl the Horde first and duplicate it? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> all right, so that's going to do it for Reed's draft. Um, thoughts overall on the deck, Zach? I think the deck is really, really good. I think that, you know, the, the mana curve is fine, not incredibly exciting, but the card power level is just through the roof. It's pretty strong. Do you think he should have uh, branched out into Obzon or into Mardu at any point? I mean, we saw a bunch of good Obzon cards in pack two. We saw a, a couple, we saw Pony of Back Brigade and a Butcher of the Horde in pack three, that if he had sort of moved over, he could have, you know, uh, maybe capitalize on some of the power level that he passed there. I mean, it's definitely hard to k pass a Butcher of the Horde when you're, you know, solidly in black-white and only barely into Obzon. That said, I mean, I totally understand exactly what he took. Yeah. I, I mean, it's it, it, the thing about this set, it, especially with, you know, two black-white two drops, uh, it, you don't want to get too clever with your mana and just not be able to cast your spells. I mean, his card power is always really good. He's got a lot of big creatures at four mana. So I think being conservative probably allows his overall deck to function a little bit better. 
And that way, you know, he gets to play his three green uh, dual lands and not even necessarily have to play a regular forest, which, you know, is going to give him a lot of uh, a better mana base than a lot of his opponents. Yeah, with three Blossoming Sands, you know, we basically we call that a free splash. <laughs> and, and the meaning for that is that he doesn't have to play any basic lands of his splash. Right. He gets to just piggyback all of his mana onto mana he was going to play anyway, potentially. So it ends up being pretty powerful for him as far as consistency goes. And I think that over the course of the weekend, that's what we're going to be seeing. We're going to be seeing people who will settle on different areas of power versus consistency because you can take it from zero to 10 here, right? In, in Concept Arc here, you can say, I don't care about consistency. Uh, I'm going to play all morphs, so my only consistent thing is turn 3-2 to every game, but I'm going to play five colors and take all the, the mana-fixing lands that I can. You can also go hard in the other direction, which is much more where Reed's at with this draft, which is he says, okay, two colors and maybe touching a third, and maybe not. Like, he might lay it out and say, you know what, I'm just white black. Right. So... I mean, yeah. I think he does want to play the Blossoming Sands because he has so many ways to pay life that the life game is actually really relevant. You know, oh. you see three Saddle Brutes, two uh, Bitter Revelations. So, you know, I mean, I, I think the life actually may be more important than it would be in another deck. We'll have to wait and see. All right. Well, they are ready to go back at the news desk. So we're going to throw it over there. When we come back, we're going to have the first round of action here from Hawaii. We'll see you guys in just a bit. Marshall Sutcliffe and Zach Hill there calling the Reed Duke draft. Now, it's a pretty interesting table. Julian Perot is a French PTQ winner here in his first Pro Tour. Sun Han Yung, Japanese PTQ winner, this is his eighth Pro Tour. Michael Good, 30-year-old Canadian, he went four and four on day one at Theros, but then fell to four and nine. That's a one-five draft record, so he's looking to improve on that at his second go-round here at the Pro Tour. Then you've got the Belarus player, Alexei Aramoniak. Then Jeremy Dizani, of course, our player of the year. John Stern with his two Grand Prix titles at Atlantic City and Atlanta. And then another two-time Grand Prix champion, Seth Manfield. But who should our second drafter be? Well, of course, it's the player of the year. It's Jeremy Dizani of France. We're going to send it across for the first time to the video wall. Every pick, as it happened just a few minutes ago, in the company of Pro Tour historian Brian David Marshall and Randy Bueller.